Okay, you all should have received a message that said that this is being recorded. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending this uh, Great Lakes 101 for Lake Ontario. My name is Roy Woodrick uh, with New York Sea Grant, and uh, this is our, our first foray into this uh, contractor-centric training. So uh, thank you all for being here today. Um, this is a joint effort between ourselves, Department of Environmental Conservation, Army Corps of Engineers, Department of State, to try to make the permitting process easier for those on Lake Ontario. Um, okay, so just to let you know that this meeting will be recorded. I did mention that um, so that people can see it afterwards. Everyone will be muted except for the speakers, but feel free to use the chat function, which is on the um, lower right of the screen. Uh, use that chat function to ask some questions throughout, um, and we'll have a question and answer session at the end with all the speakers for today, including myself, DEC, DOS, Army Corps of Engineers, um, and the recording presentations and resources will be published later at NewYorkCGrant.org after uh, after we have a chance to upload those. Uh, the agenda today is myself uh, talking about coastal processes, Molly Farrell and Beth Gildard from New York State DEC to talk about uh, the permitting process. Matt Maraglio and Peter Bazan with New York, New York State Department of State talking about coastal consistency review. And then finally, Steve Matibier from Army Corps of Engineers will talk about um, some federal considerations for uh, shoreline permitting. And then we'll put that uh, question and answer session in the end. Um, why are we here today? Uh, we wanted to make um, the permitting process easier for everybody working on Lake Ontario, whether it be property owners, um, public land managers, or the contractors themselves. Um, we will try to detail why these regulations are in place, provide backgrounds on what considerations go into permitting decisions, go through examples of successful permit applications, um, talk about local, state, and federal perspectives, so CHA versus DEC versus DOS consistency review, and the federal standards as well. And then we're going to try to answer as many questions as we can in regards to the coastal environment regulations and the permitting process. Um, so I myself, I work with New York Sea Grant here in SUNY Oswego, and my um, area of uh, work is with Great Lakes Coastal Processes and Hazards. So that's what I will be talking about today. Uh, this is kind of the driver behind why many of the regulations are in place, because uh, we do have a, an extremely dynamic shoreline on Lake Ontario. Um, these shorelines have formed and continue to change based on various geological climate and weather processes. Um, the coastal processes themselves are uh, this, this interaction between wind and waves and shorelines um, and the sediment transport along the shorelines as well. So uh, to boil that down in just a few words, it's the erosion and accretion of shoreline features. So erosion is the taking away, the accretion is the building up. So the building of your barrier bars, your beaches and uh, dunes. Uh, shoreline structures, uh, shoreline type, Wind, waves, water level levels all factor into these processes, uh, but they are natural processes. Uh, but sometimes they kind of conflict with the human influences and the way humans like to live on the shoreline. So we're trying to find these uh, um, happy middle grounds between uh, humans on the shoreline and the uh, natural processes that affect them. Um, so when I talk about processes, um, I'm mostly, we could talk about how water and uh, sand and everything moves throughout the lakes, but we're what we're really considering here today is how those uh, shorelines are affecting what is happening at the shoreline land interface. Um, so this is really what uh, the permitting gets into, uh, the things we're trying to avoid, and uh, the processes that we're trying to uh, uh, live in uh, harmony with along the shoreline. So um, this is mostly dependent on shoreline type, which I'll get into in a few minutes. Uh, but what we're really trying to avoid at certain places, like the scour in front of vertical walls. So that's when the wave comes in, it hits the wall, it goes straight down and pulls a lot of that sediment off the shoreline back out into the lake, where that could be in another way, uh, uh, building up the shoreline rather than causing erosion and uh, leading to the loss of beaches for a lot of people. We also want to avoid obstruction, which if you look in the uh, bottom right hand uh, uh, diagram there, obstruction would be this, uh, this little 
you know, a shoreline feature that's sticking out into the lake. It's trapping sediment because sediment is usually going to move in Lake Ontario from west to east. So if you put something out perpendicular to the shoreline, it's going to trap it. So that's something that we want to avoid because then the downdrift, which is uh, farther down the shoreline, it's going to lose that sediment to build up the shorelines. Uh, and also reflection. If you look in, back to um, the, um, the image on the bottom right and the top, um, what's happening here is that you can put walls in, but you know if they only go to the end of the properties, they could cause reflection on neighboring properties. So that's what we see in the upper right and in the uh, cartoon diagram in the bottom. So let's talk about shoreline types. This is certainly uh, my favorite uh, part of it coming from a geologic perspective. And uh, we have quite a diversity of shoreline types here on Lake Ontario. Most common, of course, is bluffs. Um, this could take many forms, but usually you have, um, you know, steep banks, 10, 20 feet upwards of, you know, much higher than that on Lake Ontario. Um, but they're often comprised uh, or composed of loose glacial sediments, so they're easily erodible. So rocks, cobbles, sand, clay, kind of all that is mixed in there together. You can get anything from fine clays to, you know, boulders the size of uh, uh, your head at least. Um, so uh, when we think about bluffs, we think of erosion not only from the lake, the toe scour um, at the, uh, the toe erosion scour at the base of these um, coastal features, but also from the lakeside and landslide and landside erosion issues. So um, your groundwater infiltration coming into like a, a flat layer that it can't really uh, penetrate through like some like some clay, uh, pushing some water out towards the bluff and causing soil creep and freeze thaw issues in the winter. Um, so these Bluffs are really considered important in that they um, are providing a lot of needed sediment to maintain a lot of the coastal processes that are happening. So a lot of our shoreline uh, uh, material is from these bluffs. So a little bit of erosion is good for these, for the whole system. Uh, but we also need to balance that with uh, the people living on the shoreline and making sure that they can, you know, live happy lives and not have to worry about uh, their houses falling into the lake. Um, Sandy beaches and dunes, these do not uh, compose a majority of the shoreline by any means, but um, they do tend to create large portions of the shoreline um, distance wise. So Eastern Lake Ontario, uh, many, many miles of very rapidly eroding sand. Um, these are very susceptible to storm events because that sand is so much easier to move. You think of, um, if you have uh, a pile of wet clay on your desk, or if you have a pile of uh, um, sand, if you blow on one, the sand's going to go right away, but the clay is going to stick around. So this uh, this coastal processes work much the same way. Um, so sand moves very easily and is especially susceptible during storm events. Um, our bigger uh, concerns here uh, is that they are very difficult to work with, and I've seen some very good projects on Lake Ontario, so it's not impossible. Um, but uh, there are ways to uh, work around certain uh, erosion issues, do it environmentally sound way, because these are extremely valuable ecologically. <laughs> and um, it's also uh, very easy to make mistakes with these shoreline um, types as well. Um, so I do want to mention rock and bedrock very quickly. These are very uncommon on Lake Ontario, as opposed to uh, our Monday workshop with Lake Erie, which were they're extremely common. Um, the rock themselves are stable, uh, but where you can come into issues is with uh, the bluffs and the sediment that sits on top of these rocks in, uh, in some coastal areas that could cause significant erosion. Um, again, valuable ecological habitat because some plants, animals, insects are only going to live and prosper in certain areas. So we want to, however rare or common, we do want to conserve a lot of these ecological zones on the shoreline. Um, cobbles and beaches, uh, very also very common. Um, 
often uh, make up the shorelines at the Toe of Bluffs, low beaches and barrier bars. And they're found pretty much throughout uh, the Great Lakes and especially Lake Ontario. Uh, very changeable with wave action, but also relatively stable. So there will be days, especially in the winter this time of year, where I will go out um, outside our office, which is at SUNY Oswego, and the uh, the shoreline will look different when I get here at 8 a.m. than it will when I leave closer to 4 or 5 p.m. Um, that's how quickly these things can change. Uh, and you can, in the winter, you can even hear it. The winds, the, the waves will push the cobbles up and pull them back out into the lake. And it's really the one erosion process that you can hear happening at all times. Um, again, the concerns are the upland erosion and the bluffs that are often found um, with them. So you look in the western portion or the left side portion of this, uh, if the wave action does get up beyond this and waves often do not find these cobbles to be uh, a detriment, they uh, can get to that shoreline and um, do some erosion there as well. So looking a little closer at some shoreline types, this is where, uh, and this is in Cayuga County where we have a mixture of both bluff and cobble beaches. So um, we have the cobbles, but we also have this active, uh, actively eroding bluff. And this is a natural feature. So it's not, you know, there's no homes or anything um, in danger of going into the lake here. Uh, but what I wanted to emphasize here, is that this was very early spring at a point where we're still getting that freeze thaw overnight. Um, and that is leading to a lot of uh, movement of soils and sediments and rocks and trees and everything down this slope. So it freezes overnight and then it just kind of liquefies as it warms up throughout the day. So we can see pretty active erosion here. I know this day there was just rocks tumbling down the whole time. Um, another actually quite nice example of a cobble beach is the one at Port Bay. Um, this is um, generally what we're looking at with um, Cobble beaches. Uh, in this case, it's a barrier bar, so there is kind of this uh, this mounding on the shoreline uh, that protects the inland uh, inland bay here. And I did want to emphasize that this is um, when we talk about nature based shorelines, we're not always talking about just you know planting grass and sticking trees in. Uh, but this is an instance where uh, root wads were buried into the shoreline and actually have uh, really made a, a nice uh, stabilization. Uh, here in uh, Port Bay. So I just wanted to talk about that real quick. Uh, the bedrock, um, not again, not common, but um, definitely part of our Lake Ontario shoreline. So this is up in uh, Jefferson County where um, we see this uh, kind of interaction. This is pretty far from the lake shore itself at that time, uh, but it is uh, a nice Example of how the bedrock will often look, but there is some small bits of erosion here based more uh, probably on freeze thaw and the local fractures of the uh, that's happening to the bedrock, but also that we can, you know, we, we worry sometimes about planting too close to the rocks, but uh, nature and sometimes at some points will just, you know, do what it does. And these plants and that, these plants along the shoreline, especially these cedars are doing just fine. Um, sand, as I mentioned, is uh, extremely difficult to work with, um, and most of that is because of the reflection and the, the fact that the sand just can't really stick up for itself against the power of the lakes in some um, instances. Uh, what I do want you to take away from this image, though, is that uh, immediately to my right, as I took this photo, um, is a rock riprap wall that had fallen into disrepair. Um, not in disrepair, farther down into this is another riprap wall and one which had been uh, completely covered in another spot. So we're actively working with this uh, trolley property owner to try to solve those issues. There's been a lot of great work that has gone on here, but um, kind of gives an example of what you know people did in the 50s, 60s, 70s. It's not going to work in all instances. And, and when you're working with sand, it all is uh, accelerated when we talk about erosion. Uh, another sandy area, this time not necessarily a natural one, but one in Soda's Point where sand was used as a resiliency option to actually stabilize the shoreline and to um, reduce the amount of wave action that and flooding that was happening in that area too. So this is the case where sand was simply brought in and planted extensively with dune grass and um, structured with the dune fencing. Um, and they built this nice set of dunes there. So 
Um, a lot of uh, much more opportunity for nature-based and natural process type resiliency actions on Lake Ontario uh, than in other places. Very quickly, and to just finish up my portion today, I wanted to overview some uh, resources for contractors that are available from some of the organizations represented today. Uh, the first one I want to mention is the Engineering with Nature atlases from uh, uh, Army Corps of Engineer. Uh, these are atlases. They are seriously, you get your money worth with these. Uh, they're mostly nature-based type options, but also with an engineering background. So you can get a lot of uh, really innovative ideas in here and not just put some plants down, put some seeds down. This is really heavily structured, uh, but more environmentally friendly than a lot of what we've seen in the past. And this is a free resource from Army Corps of Engineers. We do have a couple uh, resources from New York Sea Grant that I wanted to mention. One would be, uh, it's not pictured here, is the Shoreline Erosion Management Guide, uh, but the one that is, uh, highlighted here on the right is the Working with Nature Guide. Uh, this is kind of not so much about building natural based shorelines, but the plants that you could use when you do uh, pursue that. Um, we also have a shoreline contractor list that I, uh, if you're not already represented on that, please contact me and I'll make sure you get on there. Um, and we have many other resources available today from the organizations represented, Army Corps, Department of State, DEC. Uh, so feel free to reach out to them. And uh, if we don't have the resource yet, we will work towards um, uh, creating one if it does not yet exist. Um, some future plans for what we're looking to do with contractors. We wanted to hold these meetings in person. Decided it probably wasn't a great time to do that this year, uh, but we want to do it more focused geographically. So area Chita Erie, Chautauqua, Niagara, Orleans, Monroe, Wayne, Cayuga, Finger Lakes, Eastern Lake, Ontario, um, and St. Lawrence. The final two, we've actually already started doing some uh, natural nature-based features workshops. So if you've been able to attend those, that's great. Um, but we will, um, that's something we plan to do a little bit more often in the future. Um, there is uh, my contact information at the bottom right. And um, right now I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna transfer it over to uh, Molly Farrell with New York State DEC. And if there's any questions, then I'm happy to take them right now. If not, I don't see any. So I would just say, uh, Molly, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Roy. Uh, as Roy said, my name is Molly Farrell. I'm with the New York State DEC in Region 6 in the Division of Permits out of the Watertown office. And today I'm going to kind of give a broad brush overview of permitting with a lot of um, tips on how to prepare applications and things to think about in terms of how we're looking at your application when it comes into our office. So to start, I wanna talk briefly about human services and ecosystem services and how they can be melded together in a project. Um, and then I'll talk about what we're considering when we're making permitting decisions and how we are interacting with the application materials that you submit. Um, and from there, I'll talk about our jurisdictions on Lake Ontario and the St. Lawrence River and in wetlands. Um, and then from there, I'll talk about the two kind of broad categories of permits, general permits and individual permits, and some of the differences amongst them. And then I'll talk about what to include in your application um, and what needs to be added when you're applying for certain kinds of applications or permit types. And then from there, I'll talk about permitting considerations or, or tips to consider when you're putting together your application. So I think it's really important when you're talking about shorelines and shoreline permitting to sort of ground that whole conversation in a definition of what a shoreline actually is, ecologically speaking. So a shoreline, by definition, is an area of transition from an upland habitat to open water. So it's an area that is in constant flux. It is not, it's not meant to be stagnant. Material is always moving and flowing along and through a shoreline accruing in one place and depleting in another. So when we try to lock shorelines in place, we're, we're kind of fighting against the fundamental nature of a shoreline, um, which causes it to be a bit challenging. 
So I think it's important to consider that it is possible to blend human and ecological needs in concert with one another. It doesn't have to be an either or dichotomy. So it's possible to have your, your built environment, so your, your house, your shoreline house, um, with a functioning ecosystem that supports that house. So in, in this example, there's two houses that have completely vegetated shorelines, but they still have their view sheds. They still have access to the water. Um, and I think that's something that's becoming increasingly critical to, to think Think about in shoreline management in the wake of extreme weather events. So do you need a permit is a question that you should always ask yourself before you're even really beginning or getting too far down the rabbit hole of a shoreline project. Our jurisdiction varies significantly from site to site, particularly on the St. Lawrence River. Um, so just pick up the phone and call us when you're in the early stages of designing a project and we can sort of talk to you about what you're thinking of doing and let you know sort of broad brush whether or not you're likely to need a permit. Um, so call your, your regional DEC office. For my office, that's anybody in Jefferson, St. Lawrence or Lewis County and ask to speak to somebody in the division of permits. So rules of thumb, if you are on a shoreline and you're using heavy equipment, you likely need a permit. If you're grading something, you likely need a permit. If you're building anything that's supported by pilings larger than 12 inches in diameter, you're going to need a permit. Uh, if you're adding fill, you're going to need a permit. And if you're in or near a wetland, you're definitely going to need a permit. So before um, going too far down a design process for a project, just pick up the phone and call us. We're happy to come out to your site and meet with you or, and talk about what our jurisdictions might be and then walk you through the permitting process. So it's kind of, I call them brainstorming meetings are, are really mutually beneficial for us and the applicants. So fundamental questions, when we get a new application into the office, one of the first things we look at is, is this project jurisdictional? If it's jurisdictional, we then look at, what are these people actually trying to accomplish? What are their goals? What are they building? What are they doing and why? So kind of the who, what, where, when, and how of a project. So then within that, we have to answer, is this project reasonable and necessary? So if you come in and you're building like a residential dock and you say, oh, I want a, a 300 linear foot long dock at my shoreline property, we're gonna be like, hmm, that seems kind of extreme. Why? Why do you need a dock that's that long? And the reason why we're asking you those questions is because we need to determine if that's a reasonable and necessary project. And from there, we look at what are the environmental impacts of this project? We screen the project to see if the site is a hit for bats and eagles and rare fish or Blanding's turtles or, or wetlands or things like that, because that impacts how we go about permitting that project and what conditions might apply to that project. And then beyond that, the project has to meet permitting standards. So for every type of permit we issue, there's a set of standards written into the regulations. If your project doesn't fit within those parameters, then it can't be permitted without modification. But the question that gets asked even before any of those things get considered is just, did the applicant give us enough information to even begin reviewing their proposal? And, and then surprisingly large percentage of the time, they didn't. So then we have to spend time doing what I call chasing breadcrumbs to get the information that's missing before we can begin the review process. So that is the thing that you as the applicant or you as the consultant or contractor working with the applicant has, has ultimate control over is the quality of the information that you provide up, up front. So our jurisdiction on the St. Lawrence River varies depending on what the type of shoreline is. Our jurisdiction extends to the top of the bank because the St. Lawrence River is a protected stream. So if um, you have a, a, a sheer bank, so I think of Wellesley Islands, um, when I think of this kind of shoreline, the jurisdiction is the top of that bank. If you have a steadily sloping shoreline like, like this one, it's going to still be the top of the bank, but the top of that bank is going to look a little bit different than the top of the bank for the first example. If you have a, a graded shoreline, which is often the case in a lot of residential properties that like steadily increases upward at a low, slow, at a low angle, the jurisdiction line is going to be 50 feet back from the ordinary high water line, which can really be quite a substantial chunk of a property that is jurisdictional. Uh, if you have a, a shoreline that is terraced, whether naturally or artificially terraced, it's going to be the first break in that terraced bank. That's the jurisdiction line. On Lake Ontario, it's a lot more cut and dry. I think of our jurisdiction on Lake Ontario like a, a bathtub ring around the entire lake. 
that's fixed at the elevation 247.3. That's a 100 year average of high water on Lake Ontario that is written into the regulations. You can figure out where mean high water line is on your property um, relatively easily by starting on a really calm day. You go to the, the NOAA website that kind of corresponds with where you are in region six for us. It's the Cape Vincent weather station. They um, measure the elevation of the water in Lake Ontario on like six minute intervals all the time to figure out what the elevation is currently and you, you work from there. Um, it'll either be higher or lower than mean high water. So you can stick a yardstick in the water, measure the difference up. In my example, it's a two foot difference. Tie a string, run that string to shoreline, make sure it's level with the line level. Um, and where that string hits the shoreline is where the ordinary high water mark is on your shoreline. And so if you're on the, on the waterward side of that line, that bathtub ring, your project is jurisdictional and you need a permit. If you're on the landward side of it, you don't need a permit. So terminology, during the high water events, we discovered in working on oodles of shoreline projects that there was a lot of differences in how people refer to the same structure. Um, so this structure where it's loose rock on the shoreline, I call that riprap, which is loose rock laid on a stable slope on the shoreline, usually with filter fabric underneath it. If you have a structure like this, that's big limestone blocks, that's a step back limestone block wall that happens to have loose riprap as toe protection. The larger the step back in that wall, the better. People always ask like, how, what's the minimum? I have to step a wall back. Um, and really as, as big of a step as you possibly can have, because particularly if you get less than a foot of a step back, it really turns into more of a vertical wall than a step back wall. Because the benefit of a step back wall is it's allowing for wave energy to dissipate as the water, the waves are rolling up the shoreline. So vertical walls are self-explanatory. It's a, it's a vertical wall. They can be made of lots of different materials, concrete, ready rock, limestone blocks. If you don't know what ready rock is, it's in this picture to the left. I think of them kind of like Legos that fit together. They have a very minimal step back to them. This in the foreground is a vertical wall made out of gabion baskets. We really don't like to see gabion baskets on the shoreline because ice and debris will get into those gabion baskets, which are kind of like made out of heavy duty chicken wire and they get ripped apart and then all your rocks fall out and it defeats the purpose of the wall in the first place. Oh, and ready rocks, um, we have found they really, really don't hold up well um, on Lake Ontario. So permit types, broad brush permit types, you have water quality certifications, protection of water permits, freshwater wetland permits, and then coastal erosion hazard area permits. There's a great website. If you Google New York State DEC, do I need a permit? You'll find a big table that has lots of links in it that tells you oodles of information about all the different kinds of permit types. So starting with water quality certifications, 401 water quality certifications um, are four projects that may result in a discharge to, the, to a water of the U.S. They're triggered by Army Corps Section 404 jurisdiction. Some projects are covered under blanket water quality certs, which basically means that when Army Corps issues their nationwide permits, the DEC looks at them and it's like, okay, so for this nationwide permit, we're okay with the projects that are described here, so long as those projects fit these set of additional conditions. Um, so if your project fits that, then you can be covered under a blanket water quality cert. Um, but we can't issue a blanket water quality cert or a standalone water quality cert until we know which nationwide permit the Army Corps is using or if they're using a nationwide permit at all. So the bottom line is, is water quality certs are, are kind of complicated. So if you're working in a stream or river or lake or a pond, so you might be installing or repairing a bridge or a culvert, you're digging or excavating, you're placing fill, you're installing a dock or a boathouse, things of that nature, you're gonna need an Article 15 protection of waters permit and you may or may not need a water quality certification. Um, so there are different types of Article 15 permits. There's stream disturbance permits when you're working in um, protected stream, uh, there's different classes of streams that are protected in New York State. Excavation and fill is kind of self-explanatory. You're taking out fill, you're putting in fill, you need this kind of fill if you're working in the navigable water. Um, dams and impoundments are covered under Article 15. And then there's docks, moorings, and platforms permits, which are 
a little complicated in that it depends on whether or not the body of water you're working on is state-owned land under the water or not. If you're working on state-owned land under the water, like on Lake Ontario or the St. Lawrence River, you're going to be interacting with um, New York State Office of General Services for that. So freshwater wetlands, if you are doing anything really in a wetland, if you're placing fill, you're excavating, you're building something, you're expanding an existing structure, you're clearing or cutting vegetation, you are going to need an Article 24 freshwater wetlands permit. And depending on where you're located, you may also need an Article 15 protection of waters permit and a water quality certification. So rules of thumb for Article 24 permits. It's important to remember that there's a whole lot of activities that are restricted in wetlands, in part because of the, the benefits, the collective benefits to freshwater wetlands. Um, there are also a whole lot of changes coming um, in the next bunch of years to New York State wetland regulations that are going to make a lot more wetlands jurisdictional for us. Um, one key thing to remember is you cannot build a house or install a septic system in a regulatory wetland or the 100 foot adjacent area to that wetland. So pathways to a permit. You can get a general permit or an individual permit, broadly speaking. General permits cover a set list of authorized activities. If all the other regulatory agencies have agreed to that list of authorized activities, the applicant often only has to apply to the DEC using a, a pretty simple form. Uh, an individual permit, the application, the application goes to all the regulatory agents and get, agencies and gets reviewed individually. Um, and work cannot begin until the applicant has heard from all the agencies. So the Great Lakes Erosion Control General Permit is the example I'm going to use today. It's for a set suite of things. If you fit this GP, you only have to apply to the DEC. So it's for repairing existing structures, um, placing loose riprap in front of an existing vertical structure to like protect the toe of a wall. Um, if, a, if a structure, like if your house is in immediate jeopardy, um, you might be able to install up to 100 linear feet of new riprap on a shoreline for that purpose. You can remove debris with motorized equipment. Um, you can repair or in-kind replacement of an existing dock. Um, you can do small living shoreline projects um, using the Lake Ontario GP, and you can do minor grading of bank slopes. This GP is valid uh, until May 27th of 2025. And like I said, applicants only applied to the DEC. So it simplifies the process a little bit in that you're only working with one regulatory agency. Rules of thumb, if you're replacing an existing erosion control structure, structure. The structure has to still be functional. Um, if it's completely failed, you generally can't replace that under the GP. There's also really limited ability for waterward expansion. You have to kind of work with a shoreline as it is now, not as it was X number of years ago. Um, when replacing the structure, you need to stay in the footprint of that existing structure. So if you're replacing a dock under the GP, the dock has to be the same size as the dock you're replacing and no new vertical structures. So why new, no new vertical structures? We generally don't like to see new vertical structures on the shoreline unless they're, they're really necessary for the conditions at that particular site. Um, and in most circumstances, a step back wall or loose riprap is, is going to be preferred. Um, and if you have a vertical wall that's completely failed and you're thinking you'd like to replace it, we're often going to recommend that you consider replacing it with something softer, usually at least a step back wall, something that will allow for wave energy to break up better um, than the vertical wall. So why? P people always want to know wh why we have that particular opinion on vertical walls. And it really has to do with how a vertical wall interacts with shoreline dynamics. Um, they can increase wave energy and wave run up. They can, like Roy was talking about, be eroded from under, underneath um, by scouring, or they can be overtopped. And when they're overtopped, when the water sucks back out from the wall, it often sucks all your soil out with it, uh, causing the wall to fail. It also makes adjacent, less hardened shorelines very vulnerable to increased erosion pressures. So if I really want a vertical wall, what are your options? We um, tell people to site that vertical wall as far away from the water as you possibly can. Um, broadly speaking, that means get it out of our jurisdiction. Unlike Ontario, that means landward of the elevation 247.3. 
that's because the farther away the wall is from the water, the, the more protected it is. It, it's going to be more resilient because there's more space between it and where the water is. On the St. Lawrence River, that means the top of the bank. So other considerations, if you're disturbing a lot of land, so more than an acre of land, you have to apply for a stormwater construction management permit that's done online and they're issued through Albany. So you're not interacting with your local DEC office for that kind of permit. If you're discharging more than a thousand gallons of water per day, wastewater per day, you're gonna need a speedies permit, state pollution discharge elimination system permit. You work with people from the division of water for that kind of permit. Preparing your application. So the primary goal I tell people when they're working on an application is you should be able to give it out to anybody you see on the street and they should be able to read it and understand where you're doing your project, what you're doing it, how you're constructing it, what the site looks like. So it needs to be clear. Your storyline needs to be clear, not muddled with excessive details, not super vague. It needs to be your, your who, what, where, when, and how needs to be clear. Um, and your plans need to be simple. They, they're they not construction plans. They don't need to be overly detailed plans, but you do have to have dimensions for all of your structures. So if you're, if you're going to build a dock, we need to know how long that dock is, how wide that dock is. If you're putting in cribs, we need to know how high the cribs are. We need to know the dimensions of all the structures so that in the future, a compliance tech can come out to your site, look at your plan drawings, look at what's on the ground and say, oh yes, these two things are the same. Um, and we need to know the location of all your proposed structures relative to existing structures. Generally, that's a house. So the distance between the house and whatever is being built on the shoreline and where the ordinary high water mark is. So if you don't know where that is, you can call us. We can help you figure that out. All applications need a complete and signed form. You have to answer all the questions. If you're unsure of how to answer a question or if a question is relative to your project, give us a call and we can help. We need clear, current, colored site photos that show where the work is going. Um, I tell people the most useful picture, in my opinion, is taken at the property line, looking up the shoreline so you can see the water and the shoreline in the same picture. Then we need overhead and cross-sectional plan drawings that show the length of the shoreline, the dimensions of all your proposed structures, and the distance between those structures and existing structures. The cross-sectional um, is not necessary. It's not a three-dimensional thing. It's basically like you're, you're treating your structure like a, a cake and you're slicing out a piece of cake and you want to know how high and how wide whatever your building is. So like for loose riprap, I think of it like it's a right angle triangle. You want to know the width of the base and the height of the, 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 the triangle. And a location map. The location map can be Google, Google map. We need to have a, a pin drop and an address that shows you where the location of the project site is. Sometimes people use survey maps. That is fine too. If you're dredging, we need to know where you're putting the stuff you're dredging. So we need a map that shows where you're putting your dredge foils. It has to be an upland location. We need to know how much stuff you're removing. So we need to know the cubic yards of fill to be removed and the square footage of the area that you're dredging. We need to know the current depth to the river or lake bottom and your proposed depth. So basically, how deep are you going with your dredge? If you're working in a wetland, you need a delineation. We delineate wetlands for free. You can call and talk to one of our biologists and get on their schedule. They'll come out and, and mark out the boundaries of your wetland. Um, the plan drawings need to show the wetland boundary and the 100 foot um, adjacent area to that wetland. There are fees associated with Article 24 permits that vary depending on what you're doing. Um, so there will be a fee to pay for that permit. And in conclusion, just to reiterate, before beginning a shoreline project, pick up the phone and call us. We're happy to discuss your project with you. We're happy to do pre-application site visits if need be to help clarify things. Um, we do sometimes all agency visits for really complicated projects. And like I said, our jurisdiction varies from site to site. So it really never hurts to just give us a call during the early stages of design projects. It often helps avoid bottlenecks moving forward because we can kind of nip those bottlenecks in the butt really early on. So pick up the phone and, and give us a call. And with that, that concludes my, my talk. So I am going to stop sharing and pass things off to, um, to Beth.
Okay, thank you, Molly. My name is Beth Geldard. I work for DEC in the Western Flood Hub section um, out of the Region 8 Avon office. I cover uh, multiple DEC regions, regions six through nine, um, and that covers um, the Lake Erie and Lake Ontario coastline. Uh, my primary focus is managing the coastal erosion hazard area permitting program. Um, today, I'm going to talk about you know, what the coastal erosion hazard area program is, uh, our permit issuance standards, um, the nuts and bolts of what we would like to see in a permit application. And then also I'm going to go over an example permit application. So you can see really the level of detail that we require uh, in an application for working in a coastal erosion hazard area. Okay, so article 34, coastal erosion management permit. This is another permit type that uh, is often required for working on the Lake Ontario shoreline. Uh, the primary focus and really purpose of this program is to promote and preserve the lake shore's natural features. Um, when I say natural features, those are near shore areas, beaches, dunes, and bluffs. Um, and to really limit the development uh, within these areas. So create almost like a buffer area between you know, your upland development and coastal processes um, and trying to really preserve um, you know, the, the natural resources and the processes that you know, are, are going on along that lakefront. Um, you know, limiting the development all along the shoreline, it does protect upland structures from becoming prematurely destroyed or damaged due to flood and erosion. Um, so, so really the primary goals is to protect the features and then to limit the development um, within these features. So before we can um, authorize an activity for working in a coastal erosion hazard area, all projects need to eat, meet all of our permit issuance standards. Um, similarly to other DEC programs, the project has to be reasonable and necessary considering alternatives to the proposed activity. Um, this is, these are um, one of the most important really in, in my opinion. Um, you need basically a need for your project. So if you um, feel that erosion protection is necessary at your site, um, you know, have other alternatives been considered to reduce the amount of hard structural measure? Um, you know, can it be reduced to just immediately in front of the dwelling that you're trying to protect? Um, or can you limit the, maybe the height of the stone? Um, considering all that, really trying to figure out what's truly needed at the site to meet your project goals. And then the project itself, it can't cause a marginal increase in erosion at the site or the adjacent areas. So really trying to um, you know, make sure the end sections of a structure are properly tied in and um, minimizing you know, the amount of lakeward encroachment in areas and or maybe not you know, going all the way to property boundaries where adjacent areas are unprotected um, are all considerations to, to try to, to you know, decrease the chances and minimize, really minimize the adverse effects to your adjacent areas and in, in the beaches. Okay, so coastal erosion hazard areas, how do you know if you are in one? Uh, the top right image, uh, that red line all along the coast, that identifies where we have mapped coastal erosion hazard areas. Um, to determine if you are located in one, you do have to reference the coastal erosion hazard area maps. All of the maps can be downloaded and viewed at that link at the bottom of the screen. Um, an example of what these maps look like is on that image to the left, and they're old uh, blue maps. So the coastal erosion hazard area is essentially made up of two different jurisdictions. You, um, the primary jurisdiction is the natural protective feature area jurisdiction. This is delineated on the coastal erosion hazard area mapping by the solid blue line that runs along the coast. And this area is regulated um, from essentially out in the water up to the landward limit of that solid blue line. Um, to determine where this line actually falls on a property, you would need to scale uh, use the scale on the maps 
and use like the center line of a road or maybe um, a structure that you know hasn't changed since the time of the mapping to essentially get a distance um, that you could you know ground truth in the field. Um, the natural protective feature area is really the most re restrictive um, when it comes to the um, you know, development. So really the only thing that's allowed um, as far as new development in the natural protective feature area are like water use structures, such as, um, you know, elevated access structures to obtain beach or water access, um, erosion protection structures when necessary. Um, and really that's about it. Um, so no building, residential building structures, decks, patios, things of that nature. The other jurisdiction in the coastal erosion hazard area is called a structural hazard area. Now this area is only mapped in areas where there's long-term average erosion rates of one foot or greater per a year. Um, the area is identified on the coastal erosion hazard area maps by that uh, solid dashed line. And so the structural hazard area is essentially regulated um, from the landward limit of the solid line on the map to the landward limit of the dashed line on the map. So the area in between. Um, within this area, there are um, activities within our regulations that allow for new building development. However, they must be movable structures, which is elevated, um, structures elevated on piles, or piers, and they have to be set back at least 25 feet landward of the natural protective feature area line or that the solid line on the map essentially. Um, so really, if development is proposed, especially building development, we will often require that these, um, the natural protect protective feature area line and or the structural hazard area line is plotted on your project plans. So we can really see where this development is occurring in relation to our coastal erosion hazard area jurisdiction. And again, as you can see from the mapping, this jurisdiction can extend well beyond um, your mean high water elevation that 247.3 that uh, Molly was discussing. So even though you're working um, above the mean high water level, you may in fact still need DEC permits. So again, just always give us a call and we can help you through the process and determine what permits are required. Okay, and then getting uh, further into alternatives. So, um, you know, when thinking about a project, there's really um, four main types of alternatives that need to be uh, thought about um, prior to submitting an application. Your no action approach, um, which isn't shown on the screen, but essentially what would happen if you did nothing at the site? Um, if there's a residential structure um, on a property and there's been ongoing erosion, but that, that structure is set back, you know, two, 300 feet from the shoreline, you know, is it possible to allow coastal processes to continue um, and maybe not, you know, jump to, um, you know, modifying the shoreline right away. So what would happen if you did nothing? Um, if that's not something that, you know, would be feasible um, or a viable alternative at the site, then really looking into non-structural erosion protection would be your um, next alternative that you would look into. Um, so think of it almost like a hierarchy. Um, Non-structural would, con you would basically consider moving, um, you know, at-risk structures away from the shoreline. So if you had a deck that you were concerned about, you know, could that be moved landward away from the areas that are eroding or flooding? Um, or a dwelling, especially, um, you know, like a small cottage or um, a trailer or something like that. Could that mo be moved away rather than installing um, hard structural measures. And then your nature-based erosion protection. Um, these photos demonstrate um, a dune restoration project and a beach nourishment project. Um, you can also plant vegetative buffers, um, sometimes like minor, minor grading of a bluff and planting um, those wonders. Uh, maybe installing upland drainage if upland erosion issues are an issue and not necessarily, um, you know, erosion from, from the waves. 
Um, if that option doesn't work um, and you know all the other options have been evaluated, that's you know when you can begin to cons consider your hard structural measures. Um, hard structural measures, they should really only be used as a last resort. Um, we, we do, we're, we're pretty uh, stringent on considering the other alternatives prior to jumping to like a full hard structural measure. If hard structural measures are um, being considered, we like to see the sloped, um, you know, rock structures versus the vertical walls that um, Molly was kind of describing earlier. Um, and again, just, um, you know, full consideration, um, going through the full alternatives analysis um, prior to submitting an application and, and to a pre-application meeting, you know, we can have this discussion up front to help you along the process. Okay, permit application requirements. Um, this is essentially a checklist and um, others have gone through this, so I'm going to skim through this real quick, but really a permit application form has to be signed and completed. Uh, location map and aerial photo, Google Maps, Bing Maps, um, you know, as long as we know where this property is on the shoreline, um, that's very helpful. A stamped and signed survey, um, we like to see these mainly to determine where property boundaries are to make sure that they're accurately shown on the project plans. Um, a very descriptive um, project uh, description. Um, you know, demonstrating or describing what the current conditions are, what your proposed uh, site conditions will be, and, and really like why you need the project. And then a detailed description about how you're meeting our permit issue and standards. So again, you would need to describe why you need the project, what alternatives you considered, and um, how your project is um, caused Will your project cause a measurable increase in erosion at the proposed site or other locations? Um, so really describing how you're meeting our standards. And recent photos of the project site um, at the project location, but also the um, adjacent areas. Um, we like to see, you know, do, are the adjacent areas protected? Um, are they still natural? You know, really what's the condition at that property and the adjacent? And um, you'd also need to provide a description of your construction methods and materials. Um, really from start to finish, uh, materials, equipment, access, we need to know pretty much everything. And then, and two, if material is gonna be placed um, below mean high water level, you know, how much material um, and, you know, if materials only be, placed above mean high water, that's also helpful um, to specifically state that. Uh, project plans, both the site plan and cross-section plan. Um, for cross-sections, if there's multiple um, kind of things going on at the, at the site, for example, if you have like a boat ramp repair, but you're also going to be repairing a, a stone revetment, we would need cross-section plans for each of those work areas. Um, if plants are going to be part of the project, we need to know um, the types of plant species you're gonna be planting to ensure that they're native, deep-rooted, um, how those are gonna be maintained to ensure that they become well-established and, and really um, a long-term maintenance plan um, is also required. And that is required for any um, new shore protection or management solutions on the shoreline. And those plans, we do have an example plan that could be provided, um, but really, you know, how often you're going to be inspecting your structure, what uh, deficiencies you're going to be inspecting, and how, if um, any maintenance activities are required, how that's going to be conducted. Okay, so I'm going to go through a permit application example. Um, the site selected is in the town of Richland in Oswego County. Um, this site specifically has a residential structure, which is fairly close to the eroding edge. Um, it is up on a bluff with a fronting beach. The site had an old um, concrete structure that was undermined and failed. Um, so the, the um, 
the site, they they essentially want to um, install erosion protection to to protect the dwelling. And so again, you know, showing your location map, an aerial photo, and then also a survey um, if you have one is is helpful. Okay, so the project description. Um, so for this one, there is an existing three foot high concrete wall that will be replaced with an 11 foot high stone revetment. The remaining top of bluff will be graded and planted with vegetation. The stone revetment will sit slightly closer to the bottom of bluff than the existing concrete wall and all new material will be placed above mean high water. So this gives a really good description about um, what the existing structure was, what it will be replaced with and um, where the structure will be uh, where the new structure will be in relation to the old one um, and where it is in relation to the mean high water. Okay, so I know this is a lot of text, but again, I want, I want to just make sure everyone understands the level of detail that we need um, when submitting an application. So the next step, you know, in your application would to be describing um, how you meet our permit issuance standards. So getting into the justification, for this one, um, the property has, has an existing concrete wall that has been overtopped and undermined due to high water and wave action. Prior to 2017, there was 28 feet of land between the house and edge of bluff. The high water has caused substantial erosion that has put the house at risk. The bluff is now near vertical and there's only 14 feet of land left between the house and top edge of bluff. The stone revetment is needed to protect the house from damages caused by erosion. So it describes what the conditions were um, prior to the high water, um, what they are now, really what the issue is and why the structure is needed. Um, getting into alternatives, due to the limited space on the lot and increased erosion rates, moving the structure landward was not considered a viable alternative. Nature-based solutions were evaluated, including bluff planting, slope grading, and a single row of toe stone. These alternatives were evaluated, but given the current lake level and recent storm events, these alternatives alone would likely not last long term. Given the proximity of the house to the eroding edge and the amount of erosion that occurred, a stone revetment along the bottom of bluff with vegetation planted above the stone is the preferred alternative. So for this um, project specifically, they went kind of like a, um, for a hybrid approach using um, like a stone revetment along the base of the bluff, but then planting above that. So these alternatives, it describes, you know, the no action alternative, nature-based alternatives, and, um, you know, and then getting into your, essentially your structural alternative. Um, and for adverse impacts, the property to the south has existing stone revetment that the proposed revetment will tie into. The property to the north has an unprotected natural shoreline. The revetment will only be placed immediately in front of the house and will not extend to the north property boundary to minimize adverse effects to the north adjacent shoreline. The north end section will be sloped into the bluff to further minimize adverse impacts. Okay, so all these, um, are very good key details. So going back to the drone image that was supplied, um, you can see that to the right, which is to the south of the property, there is a, a stone, an existing stone revetment. Um, here's their existing concrete wall that failed. And then to the north, it's all natural shoreline. Um, so to the north of their house, but also the northern adjacent property is, is natural shoreline. So they intend on, and what they describe is that they are gonna be tying in and connecting to this revetment and then um, not going all the way to their property boundary, but just enough to protect the dwelling. And they're gonna tie in and slope that back into the bank. Um, identifying that the revetment will be gently sloped in the bank is, um, those are good details for us. We don't like to see perpendicular end sections, which really does increase the wave action and the amount of end flanking that can occur um, adjacent to a shoreline structure. So specifically stating that um, does help address, you know, and ensure that um, adverse impacts will be minimized to the greatest extent possible. And these are the site photos that were supplied. So um, it's also helpful if photos are labeled. 
Um, sometimes, especially um, larger projects, sometimes it can be difficult to really figure out uh, where that photo is as compared to um, the proposed project. So the, you know, the bottom photo looking to the south, you can see that existing uh, stone revetment. And then again, there's another photo looking to the south, but it shows where that existing structure is in relation to the eroding edge. And the photo all the way to the right shows what the shoreline area looks um, looking to the north. Okay, construction methods and materials. So for this project, the contractor will access the project area from the applicant's property. The contractor will track an excavator down the slope and conduct work from the beach. First, the existing concrete will be broken in small sections and removed from the shoreline. All concrete debris will be disposed of in improved upland location. Next, geotextile fabric will be placed along the eroding edge, and then stone will be keyed in. The setting stone and armor stone will be installed working from the bottom to the top of slope. The large toe and armor stone will be individually placed by the excavator and not dumped down the bluff. Okay, so this gives a good indication of how they're going to be accessing. Um, we, we do need to know if you're going to be accessing um, at that property or if an adjacent property is going to be needed for access. If that were the case, we would need written permission from an adjacent landowner that they are allowing you to use their property for access. Um, with this project specifically, the fact that there is existing concrete debris on the shoreline, we need to know where that is going to be disposed of. Um, we don't want to see that concrete broken up and used on the shoreline. Um, we commonly request that that concrete be removed. Um, and then, you know, how all the materials are going to be placed and, you know, what um, the order in which that is going to occur is very helpful. Um, so getting further into the materials, the individual toe stone, toe stone will be three to four ton and the individual armor stone size will be two to three ton. Stone will be irregular in shape and the largest stones will be placed on the surface. The armor stone layer will be a minimum of 36 inches thick. The setting stone will be a mix of sizes from 100 to 500 pounds each. The setting stone layer will be a minimum of one to one and a half foot thick. And then once stonework is complete, top soil will be installed above the armor stone and seeded with native steep slope mix. So this um, describes the types of materials. We do need to see and understand what the individual stone size is going to be used um, for all layers of the structure, um, and especially the toe stone and armor stone. Um, you know, some structures are really constructed with stone that's just too small for Lake Ontario. So we like to just confirm that the structure will have that reasonable probability of lasting um, 30 years, which, um, you know, when, when shoreline structures are required, that is something that is um, written to our regulations that you know, we need to verify that these structures will hold up long term. And then um, again, if planting is going to be um, conducted, um, knowing where um, that's going to be and then providing a vegetation plan, um, which I'll go through actually after these uh, project plans. So getting into the details of the project plans, um, this is an example site plan. And all of the lines shown in yellow indicate what the existing conditions are. And everything um, in the blue is showing where the proposed work is going to be. So we need a really good plan that shows all the existing conditions as it relates to your proposed work. Um, so you can see they have the property um, boundaries outlined. Um, they show where the existing dwelling is as it relates to this existing eroding edge. It identifies where existing um, large trees are on the shoreline and what the proposed um, you know, removal plan is. Um, some are gonna be removed, some will remain. Um, and this one specifically, this plan, um, which is not always a requirement for shore protection structures, but they do identify where the landward limit of the coastal erosion hazard area 
is. Um, this would essentially be your natural protective feature area line as identified on the coastal erosion hazard area map. And this is especially helpful um, when projects are encroaching really far inland or if work is proposed to an existing upland structure, we will commonly ask for that to be plotted on the plans. Um, for shore protection structures, that isn't something that we would commonly um, ask for. So um, this project specifically shows where the um, existing concrete wall is um, as it relates to the proposed stone. So again, they're, they're minimizing lake burn encroachment um, and that is shown on this plan. It shows the, the total length of the shoreline structure. And um, as you can see here, the structure is slightly encroaching onto the, that south property in order to properly tie it into that existing structure. Um, if this were the case, if it's you know minimal encroachment, we may just ask for a written confirmation from that adjacent landowner, but often we would um, actually require a signed, another signed permit application from that adjacent landowner. Um, the same project plans and everything could be supplied with that, but we would need to um, basically issue a permit um, for both sites if the project were encroaching onto an adjacent property. Um, so this shows, you know, where, where the plantings are going to be placed in this um, kind of dotted um, area. And then this is where all the stones are going to be placed. And you can see the end section here is um, a tapered back into the shoreline. It's not a perpendicular edge that we would be concerned about. Okay, for the cross-section plan, again, you can see um, that they show all of the um, existing conditions. Those are all the areas in yellow. And um, two, I forgot to mention on the site plan, but identifying where mean high water uh, level is on your project plans and where your proposed work is gonna be as it compares to that um, is very helpful for our review and will be requested um, of you. <laughs> so this project, um, you know, as far as like dimensions for the proposed structure, they chose to use elevations, which is completely okay. Um, but as long as we know what the height, what the width is gonna be, um, and where those materials are gonna be placed as it relates to your existing um, conditions. Um, and on the cross-section plan, making sure that you show exactly where that um, your existing slope is as it relates to your proposed slope is extremely helpful. Um, again, we need to know exactly where the structure is gonna be as it relates to the existing so that we can conduct compliance inspections um, following um, completion of the project. Okay, so this is getting into the details of what a vegetation or planting plan um, would be. Um, it's not anything um, really extensive, but we need, do need to know the types of plant species that are going to be planted. Uh, we need to verify that they are native and um, deep rooted and they are something that will hold up on the shoreline. Um, so this planting plan says the bluff above the armor stone will be seeded with a uh, native steep slope mix. The plantings will be maintained by watering and weeding to ensure they become well established. Planting areas that do not survive will be revegetated until they become well established. Um, so pretty simple, straightforward, but we do need to know how they'll be maintained um, and really what the seed mix is going to be. Or if you're planting, um, you know, if it isn't going to be hydro seeded, um, exactly what the plant species will be. And um, just another note, we do um, like to see a variety of species planted, not just a single um, species, just in case, you know, one species didn't hold up. Um, the entire area, you know, eventually would still grow over if you if you had multiple species that were selected. For the long-term maintenance plan, uh, we do have a sample plan and it is much more extensive um, than this. Um, and we can, we'll gladly provide that to you. Um, but really the, the um, primary um, things that we'd like to see in this is again, how often it's gonna be inspected and what you're inspecting for and how you're gonna move forward with any repairs. So for this one, uh, the permittee shall periodically inspect the revetment at least once per month and after large storms. Inspections should look for evidence of moved or slipped material 
flanking, scour, exposed fabric, or drainage issues. If stones have shifted, the permittee shall contact the engineer and contractor to provide required repairs. The DEC shall be contacted prior to making repairs. I would always recommend that you do contact, contact us prior to making any repairs to your um, shoreline structures. Um, there's really a fine line between what's considered um, a normal maintenance activity, which, um, you know, when it may not require uh, a DEC permit. Um, so again, just always contact us prior to doing work. It, um, it's, it'll be beneficial in the long run. And um, for, you know, after submitting a permit application and we conduct our review, it's very common um, that we'll be sending a notice of incomplete application. Um, it is very um, rare that we receive an application where we don't need additional um, information. So um, if you do receive this um, to the best of your ability, you know, respond to those questions or you know, feel free to give us a call and we can discuss that. Um, but this is that letter over on the left is, is what this would look like. And then Really, uh, a permit is issued when all issuance standards are met and when all requested information is submitted. So um, prior to conducting any activities, um, make sure that you have your permit in place. And um, you know, along the way, if you have any questions, just feel free to contact us. This is my contact information and I'm happy to answer any questions. And if not, I'll be turning it over to Department of State. Yeah, it looks like no new questions in the chat. Um, so we'll try to answer as many as we can at the panel session. Um, so thank you for that, Beth and Molly. That was outstanding. Um, at this point, I'd like to introduce uh, Matthew Miraglio and Peter Bazon from Department of State who will be uh, presenting together. So go ahead whenever you're ready, Matt. Hi folks, thanks. Um, so like Roy said, I'm here with my colleague Peter Bazon to discuss coastal consistency review. We're going to focus a little more on process today um, as we've been, um, uh, a lot of the things that folks have already been saying, we, we have the same, uh, same philosophy. So uh, Roy, just confirm for me that I'm sharing. Um, I'm PowerPoint now, if you want to press share okay. or press uh, present. Yeah, I'm trying and it is not letting me actually. Yeah, there's a present. second delay lately. All right, um, I'm going to work off PowerPoint. Uh, it doesn't seem to be letting me go into uh, presenter mode right now. So while we work on that, um, I'll just start moving here. And this froze on me as well. So sorry, folks, bear with me one moment there. I, I do have a backup for you if you want me to advance slides. Can you please? Yeah, let's try that. Thank you. Bear with my very busy screen here. So share screen. Should be that one. Perfect, thank you. So we'll talk about coastal consistency of either day. If you could advance to the next two slides. Hold on, let me try to clean this up a little bit. Nixon? Nixon. Got it. All right, so you're still just sharing the, the non-presentation uh, view. Really? Hmm. There you go. Thank you. All right. All right. So uh, the Coastal Zone Management Act is the law that gives the Department of State the authority to um, undertake what's called federal consistency review. So this came about in 1972 um, by this guy who signed this into law. Uh, the Coastal Zone Management Act came about at a time when uh, there was lots of environmental regulation and rules um, becoming first and forefront in our in our um, in our country. So, think Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act um, was this this time period. This started out as a nationwide zoning effort. Um, 
the country at the time was not ready for that. So what this turned into was a type of land use regulation um, where most people lived at the time, which was uh, in proximity to, to the coast. Every coastal state and territory has a coastal management program with the exception of Alaska. So that's 37 coastal management programs across the United States. Next slide, please, Roy. So what federal consistency does is it gives a state the authority to review federal actions that are within or would affect the coastal area of that state. And it makes that uh, it gives the state the opportunity to ensure that that activity is consistent with a set of enforceable policies that the state identifies and has approved by the federal government. Next slide, please. So it applies to several different types of actions. We're going to focus on federal permitting actions today, but it's useful to know that um, it's applicable to direct federal agency actions. So an example of that is the Army Corps undertaking a dredging project. Authoritative actions, like I said, permit or, or license issuances by uh, a relevant federal agency, the Army Corps in many cases. Funding provided to a state or local government. So that could be HUD providing money to a municipality and not of interest on Lake Ontario or Lake Erie, but we do review outer continental shelf plans. So that's typical for oil and gas uh, development or the development of renewable energy resources such as uh, offshore wind. Now this federal consistency authority is one means that the state uses to enforce its goals for um, implementing the coastal management program. Article 15 permits and coastal erosion hazard area permits that you've heard others speak about before are another method um, and another authority that are used to implement the, the goals of, of the program. Next slide, please. So this tool applies state policy to federal action. So that that's huge, right? The federal government is generally, uh, generally supersedes uh, state laws and regulations. In this case, uh, the state has obtained that authority from the federal government. It encourages state and federal coordination and cooperation. So we are actively working with our federal partners to try to make sure that activities are consistent with the coastal management program early and often in the process to make sure that we're um, avoiding any last minute changes or, or uh, things that can add additional costs to the projects. It's also a useful tool to build uh, public support for, for those federal actions. Next slide, please. So New York State took about 10 years to adopt our coastal management program. So the Coastal Zone Management Act, as I said, was enacted in 1972. We spent the next 10 years designing that program. And I say we, uh, I was actually born in 1982. So uh, sadly that joke gets less and less funny every year that I give this presentation. Um, but what our program did was take a networked approach, okay? While we're not unique in having a networked approach, it is uh, more rare that there's a, a networked coastal management program approach. What that means is that we take multiple sets of state laws and place them into one cohesive set of policy. Many other states have a non-networked program whereby all of their coastal policies are uh, written into their equivalent of the environmental conservation law. Our coastal management program takes bits and pieces of executive law, of Department of Transportation law, of environmental conservation law, and puts it into one cohesive set of policy. Now, in order for our program to get established, we did have two laws that we had to um, enact. So Article 42 of the executive law is what gives the Department of State the authority to develop the coastal management program and establishes a subset of relevant coastal policies and the Coastal Erosion Hazard Act, which you've heard Beth speak about before. And that's, that's uh, the state's management tool for uh, highly erosive areas. Our coastal management program is uh, rare, but not any unique in that we also incorporate special management areas. And we'll go into some more detail about those later, but in essence, we create special areas in the state that have additional uh, regulation or additional policy protections. Could you go to the next slide, please? 
All right, and Peter, I'll pass it off to you. Okay. So where's the coastal zone area? It extends all throughout the state. So it's all along Long Island, Hudson River up until the Troy Dam, uh, St. Lawrence, Lake Ontario, Niagara River, and uh, Lake Erie. And the, the Federal Coastal Zone Management Act requires that the boundaries to extend inland only to the extent necessary to control shorelines and the use of which have a direct and significant impact on the coastal waters. So in most locations, this extends for around 1,000 feet inland, but it can vary throughout the state in different areas. Next slide, please. So where the federal consistency reviews are required, um, they, they can be for federal agency actions, federal permitting actions, financial assistance, as Matt mentioned before, and on our outer continental shelf plans. But for today's talk, we'll talk mostly about the federal permitting actions. Next slide, please. So the federal permitting actions, the applicant for a federal permit on the list must certify that they will conduct their activity in a manner fully consistent with all 44 coastal policies or with the local waterfront revitalization program or LWRP. And there is no balancing of these policies. One policy is not more or less important than the next and all policies have to be found consistent for the project to be concurrent and, and continue with its review. Um, the DOS has a, a six month review time to complete from when a complete application has been submitted to the department. And, but that time can be extended if with a stay agreement, if a mutual agreement, and if the applicant is being requested to gather more information and they need additional time to, to, to find that information provided to the state. And if, and if all of the projects and all the policies are not found consistent, it's possible that the Department of State would object to it. And if the objection is issued, the federal agency is not required, it cannot authorize their permit. Next slide, please. So what makes a complete application? As uh, Beth and Molly have already described, there's a lot of things in here that we have bolted. Everything that's in the bracketed area is what is required for a federal permit, um, including a detailed description, purpose of purpose and need, alternatives, location map, site map with above view and side view showing the ordinary high water line as it relates to the project and uh, color photos and um, abutting landowners. Also, you should be uh, putting in there is the joint application, which the DEC would require and the Army Corps would co require. Additionally, the Department of State uh, requires a federal consistency assessment form or FCAF, which is our, our own personal uh, form that we'll need also as part of our application process. Next slide. So here's a copy of what the FCAF looks like. It's only three pages. The first page is just a, a brief description of the activity um, and the purpose, contact information. Um, and the second page shows a list of certain activities that may or may not be affected by the project. And if you, you check yes for one of those policies, it's a little hard to see here, but there is an associated policy number that's with each of those that we ask on a separate piece of paper that you provide analysis of how the project is consistent with each of those policies. And um, later on, I'll show you where a link is where you can find that information on each of those policies. And then the last page is just the signature of the applicant or the con consultant for the project. And we ask again that you sign that and date that to make sure that we have a complete application and we can re begin our review process. Next slide. So once an application has been submitted to the Department of State, there will be around a 30-day period in which uh, review staff will determine whether all necessary data has been provided. And if not, we'll send you an NDI requesting that additional information. And not until that time of that information has been submitted do, does our review clock for a six-month review begin. After that 30 days, it's possible that we'll ask for additional information, clarifying some of the uh, parts of the project that may not be provided in the original uh, submittal. And at that time, once we have a complete application, we could potentially have a, a general concurrence or a GC, which would help through the process and, and complete the review. If not, we might have to be required to issue a public notice for a 30-day period. And this can take up to 45 days from when we submit it to the end of the public comment period. 
if we receive any comments during that period, we'll take those comments in consideration for our review and may pass those along to the consultant. Next slide. So back to the general concurrence, this is abbreviated review, which requires no public uh, notice. And it, if it meets the project meets a certain amount of criteria, it's possible that we could issue this general concurrence and hopefully work to get the project going a little bit sooner. Other possible actions would be the a nationwide permit or the regional permit in which the Department of State has concurred with the specific acts and certain permitting actions of the project. Um, and along with the, the Great Lakes Erosion Control General Permit, if those criteria are met, we concur with that and we could issue that permit under those criteria. Next slide, please. So if it doesn't meet the GC or one of the nationwide permits, it could potentially would be under a concurrence or a full review for the Department of State. This does require a full review and a public notice. And these are usually new projects a new dock that doesn't have a maintenance or repair in place. These are brand new projects that will have a, a stronger modification or a larger modification. And it's, we could also issue a general conditioned concurrence, which would be asking the applicant to modify the project to make sure it falls under the concurrence criteria. And if it doesn't, and if the applicant is unwilling to it at a last resort, it's possible that we would object the project, again, making the federal permit action unauthorized. Next slide. Okay, uh, so if we get to the point where we're issuing an objection, there is an appeal process. Um, we work very, very hard with you to not get to this point. So it is our goal to work with you to uh, be able to find ways to modify your project to make sure that it's consistent if there are uh, potential policy implications. I think in the history of the program, we've had about 40 objections since 1982. So that's that's pretty good. Um, our, our appeal mechanism, uh, if we do object to your project, is to go through the US Secretary of Commerce. That's the first step in the administrative appeal process. Um, the Secretary of Commerce would have to be able to say one of two things in order to override our objection. One, that the project is necessary in the interest of national security. Um, that grounds have been used once in the entirety of the Coastal Zone Management Act. The other grounds is that the project is consistent with the objectives or purposes of the Coastal Zone Management Act. And that's a three-part test. Uh, one, that the project significantly and substantially furthers national interests, that those interests outweigh adverse coastal effects, and that there's no reasonable alternatives. Um, we do work very hard to help identify reasonable alternatives to the project if there are policy implications. If the reasonable alternatives do exist, it's very unlikely that the uh, um, appeal would be successful. Next slide, please. Next slide. So we've discussed policy here. Um, think of policies as buckets of state laws and, and regulations um, that uh, describe how we review an action. So broadly speaking, the policies fit into these categories, development, flooding and erosion, public access, history and scenic resources, energy and ice management, wetlands, fish and wildlife, recreational, agricultural, and water and air resources. Um, these, again, take uh, different pieces of state law and bundle them together and describe the way that we review a particular action. Great example of this is the the wetlands policy. So the wetlands policy says preserve and protect fresh and fresh water and tidal wetlands. That's enforced by various articles of the environmental conservation law, which we use to determine if your project would affect those those wetlands. Next slide, please. Um, know that those coastal policies they are. Uh, they go beyond um, what is normally thought of as a policy. These are um, backed by New York state laws and regulations. Um, our decision here is not a parts per million type decision though. It's a policy based decision. Um, there's multiple sets of guidance language tied to each policy that state how we generally uh, apply that policy. However, know that the enforceability 
uh, of those policies is limited to what the, the language of the policy is, not necessarily the, the guidance language. And then any objections that we do are based on policy. Um, we don't have, we can't just not like your project. The project would have to be cons inconsistent with the policy for us to object to it. Like I said, that's a very rare occurrence, 40-ish times in the history of the program. Next slide, please. And uh, Peter, can you go into special management areas, please? So when the Department of State is reviewing a project, we have to make sure that it's not or is located in a, in a special management area. One of the most important ones is the local waterfront revitalization program. And this is where municipalities have a, a, a local refinement of our coastal policies to sub policies. And this is where the requirements of the community have to develop a, a consistency law for each of their own actions. And what makes this really important is that it, this allows local municipalities to have a say on federal permitting actions and potentially modify a project based on local interests. Next slide. Here's just an example of where some of the LWRPs are located in uh, on the St. Lawrence and uh, Lake Ontario. This is showing the village and town of Clayton, all that in the orange. If a project is in that, it's located within the LWRP and the local policies are applicable. It's also showing Cape Vincent, Dexter, and Sackett's Harbor. Next slide. There's also the significant coastal fish and wildlife habitats, or SIGHABs. These are areas that are designated by the Department of State upon recommendations from the DEC that have special characterizations. Um, these provide coastal policies within the affected habitat, and they're, they're meant to protect the whole habitat, whole, whole habitat and not just individual species. And if a project is located in one of these locations, policy seven of the 44 is what is turned on and we have to make sure that that policy is found consistent throughout uh, the project. And there is around 200 plus uh, significant coastal fish and wildlife habitats located throughout the state. Next slide. Here's just a map showing all these green areas of where these uh, SIG habs are located. So they're found for various locations throughout the, the state. Um, and they also extend waterward, uh, landward, I mean, uh, up uh, tributaries of some of these areas along the lake. And I can show you a link later that shows where you can find all these special management areas. Next slide. There's also the scenic areas of statewide significance or SASs. And these are designated by the DOS to have a, a scenic importance and to improve and, and maintain view sheds of certain locations. But these are only located in Hudson Valley and East Hampton. So for most people on the, on the call today, this won't be applicable for them. Next slide. Here's a link to the geographic information gateway, which where you can find all your information on your project to determine whether it's in a LWRP or SIGHAB or SAS or any other type of management area. So it's a very useful link um, to look at before you're starting a project and while you're filling out the application. Next slide. And here's just a useful amount of links that we can uh, provide you, including the FCAF, um, the, uh, and also the coastal management program policies. So if you're filling out the FCAF and you mark yes to one of those policies, uh, they'll show you where the policies are, what they are, and how you can find your project is consistent with each of those policies. So also has a link for the LWRPs throughout the state and SIGHABs. And that last link is our coastal consistency mailbox. So once you've completed your application, you can send it into that CR at dos.ny.gov link and we should be able to process your application. That's next slide. And that's it. All right, so uh, I think I see a question in the chat from Maria. Maria, I think you're looking for the uh, types of, uh, what type of federal consistency review occurs in inland areas that uh, may have LWRPs. So that's a great note. Thanks for that prompt, Maria. Um, those LWRPs, special management areas, uh, can be designated on inland waterways. Um, federal consistency review, however, does not apply on inland waterways. So in this type of instance, a municipality would develop a local waterfront program um, once approved by the New York Secretary of State the coastal policies that that community puts together are binding on state agencies, not federal. 
um, and state agencies would would take that into consideration during um, when they undertake a, a separate process called state consistency review. That's uh, an, an internal state agency process um, that most folks here would not be involved in unless you were acting as a consultant for a state agency. All right, are there any other questions? I don't okay. see any at the moment. Um, I think we go to Steve. Yep. Uh, thank you, Matt and Peter, for that. Uh, we are going to transition over to United States Army Corps of Engineers and Stephen Mativier in Buffalo. All right. Thanks, Brett. Thanks, everybody else. Uh, I'll kind of take us home here uh, with Corps of Engineers. Uh, you know, um, we do lots of stuff on the lake, and uh, you'll hear about all three agencies. Um, and uh, so here we go. So what do we do in, uh, at the Corps of Engineers? Is that the next one? Yes. We operate under two laws is what we're talking about. Uh, and um, one is this uh, very old Section 10 of the Rivers and Harbors Act, 1899. That's for the big waters. And uh, that's kind of navigable waters. Um, so in this case, uh, we're talking about Lake Ontario. And we're talking about the St. Lawrence River. We're talking about, for those of you in St. Lawrence County, the Grass River, the Oswegatchie River, those kinds of rivers, Racket River. Um, big waters uh, for navigation. This is a law put together again over 100 years ago for navigation. Uh, and, and that's what it thought about. So it regulates structures in above and below. I'll get to that uh, in the next slide. Uh, waters, the United, uh, navigable waters, the United States. And that's section 404, of the Clean Water Act. Uh, you probably heard about uh, that applies to all waters of the United States. So that would be the big waters and the little waters. Uh, and, uh, but it, it's, a, it's kind of more a, a narrow focus on what we regulate. So under section 10, we regulate any structures in work in above or below navigable waters in the United States. So that would be really anything you want, dredging, uh, docks, um, just uh, placement of dredge material was, would be regulated under that uh, as, as work, um, you know, drilling wells, those kinds of things, all that stuff is regulated under Section 10 of the Rivers and Harbors Act. Section 404, is uh, again applies to all waters of the United States, big waters and little waters, and we could spend a lot of time talking about what a water in the United States is. But for our purposes here, we're we're really on the the, the lake shore and, and those kinds of things. So, uh, uh, but but what we regulate under Section 404 is a smaller piece of the pie, and it's discharge of dredged or fill material. Uh, that's really where we are. And so, what would that look like? Uh, and uh, and and for for uh, for purposes today, uh, we're probably talking about things like bank stabilization. We're talking about, uh, again, any any uh, placement of dredge material, whether it's near shore in the, or in the open lake. Uh, we'd be talking about uh, crib filled docks uh, would be would be that any kind of, uh, you know, in the water uh, erosion uh, protection, uh, uh, kind of structural fill things. Those would be regulated under 404. So that's the kind of thing we, we would regulate. So where do we live? Uh, you know, as, uh, um, uh, as as Holly was talking about early on uh, with DEC, their, their jurisdiction moves around. Ours doesn't really. Uh, under under the Corps of Engineers, and we'll stay over here on the freshwater side because uh, we're we can talk about tidal waters, but we don't have any that we're talking about today. So, Section 10, the Rivers and Harbors Act, gets you to this ordinary high water mark. Ordinary high water mark, uh, and uh, and that's kind of the bounds of the of of the river, uh, and or the lake. Uh, and in Lake in Lake Ontario, it's 247.3 International Great Lakes Datum 1985. So uh, that 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 last piece, IGLD 1985, is important because it's different. Uh, it's a different datum as uh, anybody who knows surveying than uh, than that people use uh, normally for for upland uh, surveying stuff. So uh, 247.3 International Great, Great Lakes datum for Lake Ontario. Uh, obviously, there's not one for the St. Lawrence River because it it uh, changes elevation as it moves moves uh, towards uh, towards the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, so uh, so under Section 10, we live there, ordinary high water mark, and then under Section 404. It's also ordinary high water mark, but we also have adjacent wetlands, uh, or, uh, or would would uh, would would extend beyond that. So um, so that's kind of where that's kind of where we live uh, in uh, in 
in, in jurisdiction terms. Uh, moving on down, things that we permit uh, and kind of the, the big waters uh, we're talking about today, docks, decks, boathouses, uh, stone revetments, uh, bioengineered protective structures, break walls, jetties, sea walls, dredging. Those are the kinds of things that you'd need a permit for from the Corps of Engineers. If any of that stuff happens, water word of this ordinary high water mark uh, would, would require a core permit. We have different kinds of permits. Uh, DEC talked about different kinds of permits uh, and we have two basic kinds, uh, individual permits and general permits. And uh, we'll start with individual permits. Here's the biggest one, standard individual permit. This is for um, kind of generally reserved for bigger projects, uh, projects with uh, with larger impacts. Uh, if you're going to, uh, you want to build a brand new 300 slip marina out in, uh, on Sodus Bay or, or in Lake Ontario, you might get to a standard permit for that because you know, that's, that's, more, than, that, that's more than minimal. Uh, and we'd be looking at, at uh, maybe, maybe there should be a wider net looked at our review for that. Uh, and, uh, and, and so we do a public notice, uh, usually 30 days. It could be 15 days, but it's usually 30 days. We coordinate with involved agencies uh, like DEC, DOS, Fish and Wildlife Service, Coast Guard, US EPA. We do a full public interest review. There's a whole category of things we do looking at, the, at, at public interest review. Um, and the target processing time is about 120 days from the receipt of a complete application. Uh, and as uh, DEC folks uh, indicated and, and, uh, and Department of State as well, sometimes we don't get everything we need uh, in the initial application. So we have to ask for additional information before we can call it complete and then start that clock. Uh, but that's the target time. And so this is a permit that was, uh, that was originally envisioned way, way back when, uh, when, when Rivers and Harbors Act uh, was, was put together, figured any permit would go through this process, this big long process. Well, as time went on, realized, you know what, that's way too much work for every single thing. So the next thing we came up with was what's called a letter of permission which is uh, also an individual permit. We kind of make it up from scratch as, as we go. Uh, but these are for smaller projects. So instead of a 300 marina, 300 slip marina, you know, you're talking about putting in, uh, you know, a single dock that's, uh, that's it's, you know, a way relatively large, but really for you or, or, or a smaller business, uh, those kinds of things. Um, we would use uh, maintenance dredging is something we use for for letter of permission. Uh, if you're dredging a new thing that hasn't been dredged before and then you're dredging out wetlands, that kind of thing, probably a standard permit. But if you're doing maintenance dredging on a marina that's already been dredged before and it's a routine thing, we usually do it a, a, a letter of permission. And so the coordination with that is with resource agencies and adjacent property owners, and it's 15 days uh, and our permitting Kind of documentation at the end is uh, is a little bit more uh, a, a little bit a little bit smaller a little bit uh, um, less in depth uh, so we can use letters of permission for for a bunch of things um, we've got some some 404 activities uh, like open lake or near shore placement of treasure material we can use letter of permission uh, uh, categories to, uh, to to process again looking at 120 days. From receipt of a complete application, uh, I'll be perfectly honest with you: we're much more likely to, to uh, hit that 120 days on a letter of permission than we are for a standard permit. But this is where you want to live, if at all possible. This is where you want to live. You want to live in the world of general permits. So these are our uh, kind of established categories of activities, um, smaller, much reduced uh, evaluation times, and some don't even require notification to the core. So, you know. So general permits are are, uh, are are much easier and and much much less work to do. And there's three kinds of that, and I won't I'll go into two of them more. Um, three kinds we got: regional permits, nationwide permits, and programmatic general permits. So we're going to go to regional permits first. So a general permit, think of a general permit as a box that we build uh, for people to use. And, uh, and so it's a box, it's got a certain size and, and depth. And so uh, what we do is we, we build that box for the, we've got two examples here for docks, right? One is for open pile docks. And so we put in that box, 
okay, the docks can't be more than 100 feet waterward, more than no more than 150 feet in total length. So you can have you can have different shapes, you can have different configurations, but the whole length of the dock can't be more than 150 feet. Uh, deck is no more than 240 square feet, uh, at least 10 feet from the property line. This is an important one that we put into uh, when we built our box for this regional permit uh, is that, uh, you know, technically we don't really at the Corps of Engineers play with property rights per se. Uh, that's, uh, you know, there's other people that do that. But uh, I will tell you this, that it's a lot easier uh, and creates a lot less uh, noise if uh, if each if the docks don't encroach on each other. I've seen all sorts of different things uh, from 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 neighbors who perhaps don't like each other and and uh, things they've tried to build. And so we put in this ten feet from the property line thing. So we're just kind of maintaining the peace. So anyway, so so we've built this box. And so anything any any kind of project that fits into this box, all we got to do is say, you apply to us and we look at it and say, yep, fits in the box. We send you a letter that says, you're good. Uh, and and so, you know, we've got, again, these two, these two that we use a fair amount uh, on, on Lake Erie and, or Lake Ontario and, and, uh, and, and places up there uh, for residential docks. Uh, so those are just kind of examples of what we get to for that. Read uh, nationwide permits. Nationwide permits are are uh, something that the Corps does every five years. We uh, we reissue nationwide permits. There's about I want to say 58 or 59 of them right now uh, for specific uh, activities. Uh, we've got three here nationwide three uh, for repair and rehabilitation of currently serviceable structures. We got nationwide 13 specifically for bank stabilization. Nationwide 19 is for dredging of no more than 25 cubic yards of material. So these are ones that we use an awful lot on uh, on, on the Lake Ontario, St. Lawrence River, that part of the world, uh, because you know most people are looking to you know either build docks or repair docks, and so the, most of the, the new docks fit under those regional permits. Uh, and then if you want to repair uh, structures or docks or whatever, Nationwide 3 is the way to go. Uh, nationwide 13, bank stabilization, that's a big one. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, as Roy was talking and everybody else is talking, one of the reasons we're having this call today is that we've got erosion issues and what do you do about that? Uh, and, uh, and, and so, you know, Beth walked through the, the, the whole thing with the uh, coastal erosion hazard area uh, and how do we do that? So. Corps of Engineers, you know, we, we deal with some of that under this nationwide 13. Now, the cool thing is where you really, really want to be is down here. And, uh, and, uh, and, and earlier on, DEC was talking about the general permit for, uh, for Lake Erie, Lake Ontario, and the St. Lawrence River for, uh, for activities, uh, bank stabilization and and, uh, and and maintenance of existing stuff, uh, and and this permit has you know is is really been been a godsend for a lot of people. Uh, it authorizes many 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 things uh, that uh, that that most people do, and um, many many activities, uh, so that you don't have to go to all sorts of different people to get all sorts of different uh, uh, authorizations. Um, this permit, uh, you know, you only have to go to, to DEC, except for a few things. Um, and I'll go through those quickly, because they do exist where you guys work. Um, and they really have to do with uh, with uh, with endangered species, uh, a lot of these. Um, so tree removal uh, in towns of Jeff, all towns of Jefferson County, uh, towns of Sandy Creek in Richland, Oswego County, and towns of Hammond, Morristown, Oswegatchee, St. Lawrence County. So these, this one is for bats. Uh, we've got we've got federally related, uh, federally protected bats in those areas. Uh, the Indiana bat, the Northern Long-Eared bat. So if you're going to be doing tree removal in these areas, got to talk to the Corps of Engineers. Uh, and Really regulated wetlands in the towns of Huron and Wolcott, and Cayuga and Oswego counties. Those are also for endangered species. Uh, is where where we go with those. Um, sandy shorelines within the town of Sandy Creek and Richland, Oswego County. Okay, Sandy Sandy Creek. That's all about the piping plover, uh, and so. We have to have uh, we have to know about those, and then any regulated wetlands or sandy shorelines of Henderson, Ellisburg, and Jefferson County. So those are times where even if it fits the the, the 
permit for, for DEC, you got to talk to us. And then finally, any project that involves the placement of stone below mean, ordinary high, mean high water or ordinary high water in excess of an average of one cubic yard per running foot of shoreline, uh, you got to come to us. And, uh, and that's just, a, that's just a, a kick out in, in the nationwide permit. So we have to see all of those. But other than that, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's really a great tool for, for everybody to use. So there's kind of the, the, the two kinds of permits. Uh, and then we have some caveats and things we also need to do. There's required approvals for anything under section 404, this discharge of dredge or fill material. So again, bank stabilization, uh, placement of dredge material, timber crib docks, uh, you know, any kind of thing where you're building a, a bulkhead, although we really don't like to see the new vertical bulkheads. That's, uh, we're, we're on board with, I think, all, both the other agencies that, uh, you know, vertical bulkheads are not the way to go. Uh, but anything where you're under this 404, uh, you need a, what, what's called a water quality certification. And again, I've got eight minutes until noon. And so we're not going to go very far down the rabbit hole on this. Um, and uh, as, uh, as, as DC said earlier, you know, this is a, this can get complicated. Um, and, uh, and so you know, something, you know, we can look at, and if you have questions about a, a, a particular activity, um, you know, you can, you can talk to us or, or talk to DEC about when a water quality cert is required or, or not required. Um, just a, a quick note is that if it is, if it is required, once the DEC, or if you're doing work on Seneca, Re Seneca Nation or St. Regis Mohawk uh, uh, land, once those people make the decision, we have to coordinate that decision with US EPA for 30 days uh, after, after that to determine whether it's potential impacts to neighboring jurisdictions. So, so 401 water quality cert is one of those trump cards that, uh, that, uh, that the state has uh, so that the federal government doesn't issue something that the state objects to. The other one uh, is uh, is coastal zone consistency that uh, that Matt and Peter talked about, uh, and I won't go too far down that hole either because they did a great job talking about it. So I just threw in a slide that that's that's there. So what's in a permit? And I just want to run through some of this. We've we've heard this from a couple of people already. Um, we've got the joint application for permit, complete it, and uh, in really kind of important things, really important things. Total area of impact, square feet or acres, below ordinary high water. Total volume of dredge or fill material uh, to be over ordinary high water. Sign the application. So these things are important. The, the, what we, what we want to know is, is size and depth, you know, quantities of, of what we got. Sign the application. Do all the rest of the application that's in there, but, but make sure, you know, these are really key points. And then some drawings, and I'll, I've got some examples here for a minute in a minute uh, that we'll walk through, just like uh, we've heard before, general location map, plan view, and a cross section. Uh, and then submit them by email. This is the email address where you submit, uh, submit your application. Uh, and then you can just go to our website as well if you have questions uh, as to where to get to that. Sample drawings. So we don't need engineer drawings. Uh, and you know, uh, we just need to know what's going on. You know, this one isn't my favorite, uh, but it shows kind of, you've got existing structures, you've got where your stuff is gonna be, you got idea of, idea of a cross section, you'd wanna know how long this is from this point all the way around to that point. So those are, you know, property lines, those kinds of things. Here's a cross section, again, not engineered, but accurate, right? Uh, you know, it's like, okay, here's ordinary high water, this 247.3 IGLD 1985. You know, so what we regulate is this piece down here, this piece down here. Okay, so important things on, on, on the drawing. Again, ordinary high water, where is it? How, what's the distance here? What's the depth below ordinary high water? Same thing, this is a little more engineered, uh, but again, you've got this ordinary high water coming in and we wanna know again, that the, the, how far it is between the toe and where ordinary high water hits the, hits the existing ground. All this kind of stuff is good to have. So I wanted to toss this one in uh, just for fun. This is a this is a dock and dredge area. 
So you've got an existing peer, or if it was a new peer and you wanted to put that in, you'd, you'd put that in here and, and you would put the dimensions on the, on the new peer and all that. But then you'd want your area to be dredged, kind of outlined here, area to be dredged, and you've got a cross section. And so important things on, uh, and, and, uh, and I, think, I think DEC talked about this too, important things on a dredge, do, a, a dredge cross section. Existing bottom depth and new bottom depth and elevations would be really good to have. Because what we're gonna do is we're gonna, in, we're gonna tell you you can dredge X cubic yards of material to a bottom elevation of X. Uh, because that's how you'd find out compliance, right? Is, is, uh, is if we went out and tried to do compliance and we told you that you could dredge to, let's see, 240 uh, feet, IGLD 1985. And we went out there and, uh, and we're plunking in uh, a, a, a finder and it comes out at 235, like, oops, you went a little too far. So important, very important to get this bottom depth as to where you, what's the target? Where do you want to go with that? Uh, and then you can have a, a cross section kind of up here as to what it looks like, but uh, but those are those are important bits and pieces. And with that, that's way too short for me, but uh, but you know, kind of give you a flavor of what we're looking for. Um, you know, as every as you've heard before, if you have questions, give us a call, and uh, and and we can go go from there. And I will stop sharing and toss it back to Roy. Steve, thank you. Beth and Molly, thank you. Peter and um, Matt, thank you so much. Uh, we do have a little bit of time, um, but I do want to do some housekeeping things um, that are necessary. First of all, thank you to DEC for making these programs possible. Um, we will, these have been recorded or are in, are in the process of being recorded. So, um, don't worry about that. We will um, send out an email to both workshop attendee lists that say, here's the website where everything's being hosted. Um, I'll send the videos over to our communication staff who will post it on YouTube. Then there will be links from our website to that. And I'll try to get as much of that in the email as possible. This is not going to happen right away. It's probably going to take until at least next week till all that's ready. Uh, and also the presentations will be available too and I will also send um, contacts for the staff or for the speakers as well. Um, if you guys don't mind going a couple minutes over there were uh, a couple questions that I did want to um, uh, get to. Uh, one is is everything that we discussed today applicable in the Finger Lakes? And I want to say some of it is, some of it is not. So some of the coastal processes stuff that I discussed isn't nearly as applicable, but it's the same idea as what's happening there, just uh, on a much larger scale on Lake Ontario than say in uh, Seneca Lake. But I do want to hear from DEC on this real quick. I would say more or less the same thing. I mean, our jurisdiction is going to be different on the Finger Lakes. I don't work in the Finger Lakes region, so I'd have to look up whether or not it's stayed on land under the water in Seneca Lake. I think it is, which changes things. Um, and like whether or not Seneca Lake has a fixed elevation for their jurisdiction line is going to change with the jurisdiction line. But broadly speaking, the application process is the same. Um, so you'd probably apply for something on Seneca Lake via an individual permit using the joint application. And so you'd still need pictures and plan drawings and all of that, all of that jazz. But um, but you would want to talk to somebody in that region um, about what jurisdictions might apply on your property. The wetland stuff would be the same. If you have a wetland on the Seneca Lake, it's going to be looked at under the same regulatory framework as a wetland on Lake Ontario or any place else. All right, thank you, Molly, for that. Mm -hmm. um, one actually came through via email, and it was yesterday where I received this email. Um, and it actually came up in the Monday meeting as well. Replacing armor stone that has been pulled out into the lake by the waves. Does anybody like to handle that? Sure. 
Um, this is Beth, and I would say that um, pulling the stone that has been dislodged from an existing structure um, can be moved back closer to the shoreline. Um, you, you know, you'll likely need a permit for that, especially if you're working below uh, the mean high water level, um, but that's definitely an activity that we would allow. Great, thanks for that answer. That said, because I actually have an application that is exactly this situation that I'm working on now. Um, and I know in talking to one of our biologists, one of the things that we were thinking about is, um, what's the benefit of leaving the rock where it is? Like, it is the rock now that it's rolled downhill and it's in the water providing additional um, structure that's helping to break up wave energy? Is it creating a navigation hazard? Is it making it so you can't dock your boat? Like, so thinking about that, in thinking about how to deal with the rocks that have rolled downhill now in the water is um, is one thing that I know we were thinking about with that project that was dealing with a similar a similar situation. And you would definitely need a permit for that, mm -hmm. like Beth was saying. Do you think that's more of a case by case? I think everything kind of permitting this? is a case by case thing. Yeah, it's it's not easy to make a broad brush statement on pretty much anything when it comes to permitting because it comes down to the whole reasonable and necessary question. Um, and, and that's one of the things that definitely gets think, looked at when you're thinking about pulling a bunch of rocks back up onto a, onto a slope. Similar to like, if you have a crib dock that's completely fallen apart, like you can, you can leave the rocks that fell out of the crib in place under the water and build another dock over the top of it. And the rocks from the old crib structure provides some wave attenuation and fish habitat and things like things like that so okay i do have one additional question that's coming in when local town jurisdictions have applied for and received home rule jurisdiction over the state-owned lands underwater i'm assuming no uh, i'm not going to assume anything how do you determine which restriction to abide by? For example, if Army Corps of Engineers says 15 foot max height over OHW for a ordinary high water for a boathouse, and the local town jurisdiction says 18 feet. So I'll uh, I'll grab that one uh, yeah. since uh, since we're there. So as far as you know who owns the land under under the the, the uh, underneath the the structure underneath the water. Um, you know we don't uh, you know, we don't really have any any say over that one way or another. And uh, and as far as does one does one uh, authority supersede the other? I think the answer is no. Uh, you know from a Corps of Engineers standpoint, uh, you know we have to. For, for us to issue a permit, we have to be we have to be make sure that the the activity is consistent with the coastal management program. Uh, and if there's a necessary 401, that's fine. But uh, but you know our permit does not does not does not obviate the need for any local or other state authorizations. Um, so for example, if you need, uh, you know, if, if, uh, if you need a, a, an Article 15 permit from New York State DEC, uh, our permit doesn't doesn't supersede that and their permit doesn't supersede ours. Think of parallel train tracks and, uh, and that's what we're talking about. Okay. All right, we're, uh, we are at about five minutes over. So I apologize for that, but I think we're not uh, cutting too much into your day. I wanna thank everybody for coming on. Um, again, this will be recorded and available within the coming weeks. Uh, Holidays might complicate that a little bit. I apologize for that. But you will see the presentations, the recorded videos, and the context and the shared resources. I'll make sure that gets out to everyone. Again, thank you all so much. Thank you to our speakers. A little uh, digital clapping for that. Um, otherwise, have an excellent day. I'm going to stop recording now. <laughs>